Здравейте, приятели, аз съм Петко, а вие слушате Рацио Токс, нашата поредица от нашия формат Рацио Подкаст, в който си разговаряме с много интересни хора, които са не дошли на гости. Днес разговора ни е с Джеймс Розиндел. Джеймс преподава теория на биоразнообразието в Imperial College в Лондон и работата му е свързана с изследване на биоразнообразието или пресечната точка между математика, биология и компютърни науки. Джеймс е наш гост на нашия пролетен форум – на нашето най-голямо събитие за годината, в момента в който слушате всъщност този запис, този форум вече ще е минал, така че може да прегледате видеозаписите, които ще пуснем. Не съм още сигурен кога, но предполагам след няколко месеца. Разбира се, някои от вас могат да си вземат и онлайн билет, за да гледат а, иначе страхотните, страхотните неща, които направихме на форума тази година. Малък дисклеймер, разбира се, днешният ни разговор ще бъде на английски язик, така че надявам се онези от вас, които боравят свободно с езика, да се чувстват комфортно в този иначе предстоящ интересен разговор. Окей, Джеймс, welcome to the show, sir. Петко, thank you, great to be here. All right, you, you, you just arrived in the country, how are you feeling, mate? I love it, yeah, I love Bulgaria, I've been here several times before, so very pleased to be here again. All right, terrific. Um, all right, listen, James, you are one of the odd people um, that uh, that we have uh, in the forum in a sense that you are working in a in a weird, but I guess necessary intersection between different disciplines. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, so yeah. you do maths, biology, computer science, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a complete like mess, but I guess it's a necessary one. Yes, so ab- what's absolutely. going on there? Yeah, well, what's going on is different fields advancing independently. That's one thing you can get so far. But the real progress, I think, can be made much more easily by combining the expertise of different fields. And so I started off with maths, as the case is, probably because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do and it seemed flexible enough. And then I got interested in computer programming. And then finally, I realized what I really wanted to do was go back to my lifelong interest in living things in biology and ecology and apply those tools yeah. in that field and it turns out those tools are quite useful in that field right uh, it, it is quite rare to find in a child a fascination both in mathematics and in living things it seems to me like people you know get either uh, either either one of these yeah maybe that's true but uh, yeah i mean th- those were my passions yeah well that's terrific i mean i find uh i i realized at a very late stage that uh because i didn't like mathematics i, I have no idea how how you can break mathematics for a child and make it boring uh because mm-hmm. i mean mathematics the language of the universe you know it mm-hmm. takes a really bad teacher to do that to a kid anyways that happened to me and at later stage i realized because i was studying the humanities that in every discipline that you study you end up at a point in which mathematics is an absolute necessity, whether we talk about international relations, sociology, and biology. Yeah. Uh, you know, so so you are you are a good fit. All right, so you study biodiversity. I yeah. can see the mathematics here. I mean, we have so many species. So talk to me about that. Okay. Well, yeah. the first thing I should say probably is that biodiversity is about the variety of life on Earth as right. a whole. So that includes all of the different species, but It's the variety within species, it's the variety between species, it's all sources of variation. Um, so, for example, some species are more closely related to other to each other than other species. So if you've got three species of mouse, that's arguably less biodiversity than if you have a mouse, a bird, and a snake, sure. even though there's also three species. So it's not just about counting species. However, species is the currency, it's the thing we often talk about. Mm. Um, and so how many species are there? I guess is what you're asking. Sure. Um, and that's actually kind of difficult because there are lots of species that we don't know about. They've not been described by science would be the, the formal way of saying. So we can only really talk easily about the ones that we know about that are described. And um, we can guess at how many others there are, um, but the ones that we know about is, is the place to start. Unfortunately, we don't even know how many we know about yeah. because, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, right? Yeah. But the, the there's no central place where everything we know about gets recorded. You know, the process of naming species started hundreds of years ago, and it started with letters on paper, with sort of a, a, an academic process, but not with databases, not with computers. And so you end up with 
many different names for the same species where people accidentally describe it more than once or someone copies it with a spelling mistake at some point and then that goes down as two species and that has to be sorted out. So we've got all of that stuff going on. And then there's there's the constant reassessment that's going on. Now we have modern day genetics technology to, to, to look at the, the full genomes of species. We start to realize, oh, hang on a minute, there was more than one species here all along. Um, and so all of that process is going on um, in a kind of um, organic matter. Right. Um, and uh, and f from that, we can't exactly say how many species we've got. However, I'm coming to an answer here. Uh, the number of species that, that we have on the database at, at the OneZoom project, which I guess you're going to talk to me about sure. in a short while, is about 2.2 million. 2.2 million. And this includes all types of living creatures, including what, bacteria? Includes bacteria, yes. To yes. the elephant. Yeah, everything from bacteria to the elephant, that's about 2.2 million described species. Right. All right. Let, let's just take a quick step back and define what a species is. Because oh, you, yeah, you, yeah. You, you did say uh, in the beginning that, you, you know, biodiversity also means uh, like variety in between species. Uh, it's like like they say, it's like in a, in, a, in a community in Nigeria, you find more genetic variation than between the peoples of Europe, for example, or, yes, or something like that's that. That's right. In so, it, within a species, you can have more variety or less variety. And and between groups of species, you can have more difference or less difference. So there's all those different sources of, of variety there. Yes. So, but you asked me what makes a species. Yes. Right. Okay. So that is also has many different answers. Like what people that study bacteria can't quite use the same definition of a species that people that study animals. But the the big thing that we tend to sort of go to definition of a species is can you breed successfully with each other? If you can, then you're the same species. If uh -huh. you can't, then you're a different species. So that that's a classic definition and that's a, a, a pretty easy one to understand. But there are some problems with it, right? So um, for example, um, you have what's called ring species where uh, you've got a group of, of creatures. I realize this is a podcast, so you can't see it, but you've got one, one group of creatures on one side. They can breed with a group. Group A can breed with group B and with each other. Group B can breed with group C and C with D and D back with A. So they form like a chain, but D can't breed with C. Right. Okay. So, so you end up with a group, and some can breed with some others, and you can connect them all with ability to breed. But still, it's not that everybody can breed with everybody, and so that definition is already kind of creaking at the sides with these types of examples. Jesus, I mean, what a mess! And and, and even the definition of breeding does that mean that uh, I mean, when we define species, it can breed with another member of the species. And it can create a fertile... Yes, yes. Because yeah. there's multiple stages of, of, of this, right? The first, yeah. you need to be able to come into contact with each other at sure. all, right? Yeah. And then you need to be able to, if, if you're an animal, you need to be able to do whatever mating procedures you do yeah. uh, for that species. And that has to physically work, right? And then there has to be no genetic reasons why um, the, the embryo wouldn't be aborted or wouldn't just be fail to even be born. And then once it's born, it needs to be fertile. Yeah. Um, and to be able to sort of to live so there's quite a few stages there any one of which would cause you to sort of fail this this uh, condition of being able to breed successfully right okay so 2.5 million species we have a problem with the definitions we have problems with the taxonomy of yeah. uh, of these species is that why you decided to uh, sort of use your mathematical and computer programming skills to create a tool to help with that uh, it would be nice if I could say yes, but uh -huh. that's not really the reason, actually. Okay. The, the, re the reason is that, well, in terms of why it's messy, right, it, it just is. The more you study life, the more messy you realize it is. It's not neat. Mm. We humans like to organize things in neat ways because it just h helps our brains to understand sure. the complicated world. But, you know, life is complicated and the world is complicated. So there will always be like that. Um, as to why I was interested in building an explorer for the tree of life, it was because I wanted it for myself. Right. Uh -huh. I had gone from maths into biology and I was thinking, yeah, I want to know what are all the species? What are they related to? And I was kind of surprised that there wasn't a place I could just go to to, to see this. Yeah. Um, and there are two barriers, of course, to that existing. The first was that the information had to be there. And the second was that there had to be a user interface and a method to actually explore it. Yeah. That would be interesting or that would that would not be overwhelming. Um, clearly, that's 
that's a lot of stuff to solve. Sure. Um, but as good luck would have it, many people in the field uh, were working on the first problem um, in, in groups and just the, the, the academic community as a whole working together on that. Um, so that was clearly ticking along quite nicely. But the more unsolved problem to my mind that seemed to be a good application for the math side was the visualization and yeah. the user interface to make that a, a fun and easy thing to explore. 2.2 million species and all the connections between them. Yeah. So how did you collect all this uh, all this information? You did say that some of it is in historical records, probably in some dusty drawers or something like that, or you stepped on a pretty decent taxonomy that we already have. It's the second one. It's yeah, the second I one. didn't do any of that. So actually, when people ask me about this one Zoom project, they often and they, they ask me, how long have you been working on this? Yeah. I started in 2011, so it's been more than 10 years. And they say, oh, well, yeah, of course, there's lots of species in there. But yeah. it's not at all because of how many species there are that's taken me so long, because I've never gone there into any dusty drawers or tried to curate anything. You sure. know, that's not what I do. That's not my expertise. Plenty of excellent people are doing that work. And as good fortune would have it, there's this project in the US, the Open Tree of Life project, and they were funded to build a taxonomy um, of all life and the tree of all life. So this core data set of what are all the species and how are they related to each other came from them. Um, but to popularize that, which was the main goal, uh, we, and I say we, because it's not only me working on this project now, um, uh, we had to connect that to common names because people don't want to read Latin names. Yeah. You know, most people don't understand them. They want to read common language names. And we needed to connect them to good images of things yes. um, that we could have permissions to use. And that's what creates the experience as well as the method of uh, zooming in and out of the tree, which is uh, the sort of unique selling point of this way of doing things. Right. Just for our listening, uh, listeners, you can you can have a look at the one zoom tool on the onezoom.org website. It is it is a it is a fascinating tool. I mean, it's it's extremely user friendly. I play with it uh, a bit. Uh, it's extremely complex, uh, and it does show vividly not only how many species are out there, uh, but I think the more important point is that yeah, we are all connected in this in this tree of life. You can actually follow through, um, you know, the, the the similarities between the different species and on what on what branch a species sits. And I've done this to humans, and it is a it is a fascinating fascinating tool. Is that is that probably like the the greatest discovery of uh, of of biology. I mean, what, what what would you say about that? Because for me personally, this was a revelation for me when I realized as a kid that me and a banana have have a common ancestor at some point. You know? Well, I mean, it basically comes back to Darwin's theory of evolution sure. by natural selection. And of course, that is a, a massive, massive mm. <laughs> paradigm changing step forward. And that's where, where where this started in a sense. Although there were advances before Darwin that were quite noteworthy and many advances since Darwin. You know, for example, this whole concept of the genome and the gene and DNA Darwin didn't know ab sure. about that. You know, that just came along with research, really important research that happened since. And before Darwin, there, were, um, there was Linnaeus, noteworthy, who um, invented the system of naming species and of, of, that, that we still use today. Mm. And uh, he already was organizing species in this kind of hierarchy. And there's, there's this quite interesting quote from him, actually, where he was trying to decide where to put humans in his hierarchy of organizing things. Mm -hmm. And he ended up putting us in with the apes. And he was a bit uncomfortable but he he just said oh, I couldn't see any other way that it would work right well, he sure. didn't it's think pretty of, obvious it is obvious but he he didn't make this connection that Darwin made mm -hmm. as far as we're, uh, we're aware of evolution by natural selection but still just by looking at things closely and trying to organize them for convenience like a librarian might organize library books mm -hmm. Linnaeus was organizing his specimens and organizing life he came up with this system and he put the humans in uh, with the apes so right. that was quite insightful yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, definitely organizing information is the first step to getting some newer insights. So, yeah, I mean, there were Darwin and all of us are stepping on the shoulders of giants, is, uh, uh, you know, so to, so to say. Does that, um, I don't know, I, I remember as a kid that that brought a certain um, certain sense of humility that I'm trying to, enlist, uh, to, to, to in, instill in my kids right now. Uh, it's like, don't kill that ant. It's, it's your cousin, for Christ's sake.
thing. Uh, and it yeah. still baffles me that this is not um, the um, how to how, how to say that it's it's like the, uh, the 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 orthodox way that we look at things. I mean, humans we we still tend to to think of us as, uh, as like the pinnacle of evolution. It's like we <sighs> rule all animals and uh, and all of that. I mean, why is it so difficult for us to accept that that we are? <laughs> That we're all cousins. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think we... Well, that's a difficult question because yeah. it comes back to psychology. But sure. my opinion, this isn't... My opinion is that we we just like to feel special. You know, mm -hmm. that's just our view of the world is that it is a very human view. And uh, the view out of our own eyes will, of course, be that we're in the center of everything. You know, just like people used to believe that the Earth was at the center of the universe, mm -hmm. which was natural because we were on Earth and they, they hadn't done inquiries, uh, scientific inquiries, to realize yet that that was wrong. And then people thought, well, humans were at the center of life or the pinnacle of life, and the inquiries hadn't been done yet to realize that that was wrong. Now those inquiries have been done. We realize that we're just another tiny leaf on the tree of life. We're just one of 2.2 million. And we may think that we're better, right? But we're actually not, because all of those 2.2 million species have in common that they've survived. Yes. Right? They've managed to reproduce, they've managed to last all of this time, and they're still here. So whatever they have might not be that they have the same skills and features that have enabled us to survive, but they have other things that they can do that we can't do, for instance. Um, like a sponge, pretty simple organism, but you can pass it through a sieve and separate all its cells apart, and it will reassemble and still be alive, right? right. Well, you can't do that to us. Yeah, it's like yeah. a superpower, Jesus. <laughs> it's like a yeah. superpower. And many animals and plants have these kind of superpowers that are just crazy to mm. us, and that's helped them survive in their own way. So they're equally worthy as us. Sure, sure, absolutely. Uh, our superpower is super intelligence, you know, but uh, that's also doubtful, uh, you know. Uh, but... You know, it seems like like you described. I mean, we 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 are so centered on ourselves. It's like it's like a, it's like a child, right? I mean, it's so solipsistic and egoistic. You know, it thinks yeah. about itself, and slowly, uh, you know, it, it it grows it out. Yeah, uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully it does. So I do hope that we will we will get to that point. But in the meantime, it seems like while we are growing exactly like a kid, we are breaking everything in the room uh, while we are trying to morally and socially evolve. Uh, so. I mean, what is your what is your view? I mean, wh where do we stand right now? Because there is a, um, you know, thankfully in the current zeitgeist, you have uh, this alarmism, you know, that we mm -hmm. are really messing things up when it comes mm -hmm. to biodiversity and and all of that. So, what is what is your truth? I mean, what do you what do you stand on that? Is is all uh, is alarmism um, the true way to go? I mean, it's uh, do we have to really worry? I think alarmism is justified. Apocalypse prediction is probably less justified, okay. a lot less justified. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely worried. For example, at the uh, the, the Ratio event, mm -hmm. um, there's going to be a display uh, of all the species of life, a little single dot for each species of life, and uh, we're going to list all of the ones that are critically endangered, according mm -hmm. to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature Red List of Threatened Species. That's the official body, really, that would decide if something is endangered or not. And critically endangered is the worst the worst status it could have, really, yeah. apart from to actually be extinct. Um, so we're going to have this scrolling video display of all the names of the species that are critically endangered, and there's over 7,000 of them. So it's going to take 50 minutes yeah. just for that to reel around and get back to the start again. Now, according to some estimates, it's very hard to say, actually, how many of those will actually go extinct because predicting the future is pretty difficult, especially predicting the future of living things. Sure. But... Some predictions say, well, 97% of those will go extinct in the next 50 years. So that's quite a lot of variety of life we're going to lose. Um, in terms of how much we should be worried about that, I think we should be very worried because I think that's a, a, a wonderful thing that we're losing. Um, uh, but there are these two perspectives. So one of the perspectives, uh, and they're not mutually exclusive, you know, they can sit alongside each other. One of the, one of the perspectives is to really think, what do we need this life on Earth for to survive as human beings? And let's just make sure we don't kill off the stuff we need. And then the other perspective is, 
this is all beautiful, amazing stuff yes. that we've got. And once it's gone, it, it can't be got back again, at least not without a lot of difficulty. Mm. I saw Resurrection of Extinct Species was on your, your periodic table over yes. there of, of, of future technologies, but that's quite distantly mm. away, right? And won't be possible for everything, even if it does happen. Um, so what I'm getting to is it's really like a one-way ticket once you're extinct. So we're losing all of this. It's like going to an art gallery and burning all the artwork. You know, right. you could argue we're not going to eat that artwork you know we don't effectively we don't really need it but in in that sense but we're losing something amazing and so so both those arguments apply we need it but then we also have this more ethical um argument about the loss of something beautiful from yes. the planet and i i subscribe to both of those things right so there's the aesthetic uh, uh the aesthetic motive and then there is the practical moment uh, of uh, why is it that we need to conserve this and now you know i uh, i i think that the uh, the the aesthetic part the, the the best example probably will be the panda because i mean it uh, when i read about the panda when i observe the panda the panda is absolutely beautiful but it shouldn't be alive i mean it's uh, it looks like a silly animal it pees on itself it's lazy it's uh, you know without us it would probably go instinct anyways will it i mean i don't i don't know if that's if that's a right thing uh, to say but i guess that there is a third way to 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 view things i mean if something goes extinct maybe this is this should be the way to go, you know? Yeah. The, the, the thing we need to think about there is about the speed that things are happening. Okay, so, yeah. of course, it's the case that species go extinct naturally. After all, dinosaurs went extinct, yeah. <laughs> as in the previous podcast with Dave. Mm. But um, if we look at the speed at which that happens naturally in the history of Earth, and now we look at the speed at which it's happening now, it's 100 times faster so we've taken this thing, it, it, and also there's a natural process that balances extinction, and it's called speciation, the creation of new species. Yep. So if you've got, for instance, a species of bird and they get trapped either side of a mountain so they can't breed anymore, then eventually some different selection will happen on both sides of those mountains. We call this speciation by allopatry. If you want the technical term, there are mm. other ways. But the point is we end up with two species when we, we used to have one. And this continues, this continues to happen. We can look around the earth and see examples of this happening or half happening now. So if we wait long enough, we will get new species that don't exist today. Um, but um, that rate of speciation is kind of balanced with the old rate of extinction um, and the new rate of extinction with all the messing up that we've done of the planet mm. is now a um, hundred times more yeah. or around that. I mean, it's different ways to estimate it. Um, and therefore, we're going to see this collapse in diversity. And one of the big problems actually with all this as well is that there's a delay. So we make some changes to the earth and we think probably in our human sense that, well, you know, that's done. If nothing's gone wrong next year, then, you know, our changes that we've made haven't had any problem, you know, because that's the way we live our lives. You know, if you, if you go out and do something and nothing bad happens to you in the next 24 hours, you probably disconnect mm -hmm. the bad thing that happens in 50 years time and you don't think you're responsible for it anymore. But the problem is that nature works on these very, very long time scales. When you just look at the age of trees, right? Yeah. <laughs> they, some of them are 30 years before they even reproduce. Um, and therefore, when we're thinking about how long it takes to see the effects of what we're doing to the environment filtering through in extinction, it can take a long time, but we're not heading somewhere very good. Mm. Um, so uh, a major example of the kind of things we do that lead to loss of species is habitat destruction. Mm. Because if we think about it, species go extinct when uh, the individuals can't reproduce enough to replace themselves when they die. And so the numbers go down and eventually they go extinct. But in order to survive and to reproduce, they need their habitat, they need their homes. Just like we need to have food and we need to have a home, right? If we yes. didn't have that, we probably wouldn't make many babies as a species, right? We, so we need our habitat and uh, all of the animal species, they need their habitats as well. But if we move in and we change their habitat to make it our habitat, which is what we're doing, or to make it our areas where we grow our food, which we also need, then we're effectively just slowly strangling them. And it might take a very long time. We might not even be able to predict easily which species will be the ones to live through that process and which ones will 
go extinct, but we can say that quite large numbers will go extinct. Mm. Um, so, for example, one piece of work I did um, some years ago, we did some very rough estimates with a very simple mathematical model, and we found that um, if you wait long enough, once you've destroyed half the habitat, if you wait long enough, you'll lose at least half the species, maybe more, right? So if you think about how much of planet Earth we've covered with fields, cities, roads, all the things that we cover Earth with, then that gives you some kind of an idea of how bad it could be if we wait long enough. Uh, most people aren't thinking about what will happen in 500 years from now or 200 years from now, but that could be potentially where we're headed. Mm. Um, of course, another factor is that there are animals and plants that find our habitat works well for them. Um, so you do get city wildlife and that's important too. So it's not that it's not worth zero the things that we do. And so actually um, being able to use ha habitat to share it is quite a good way forward right. um, for uh, securing many species that we can live alongside. Right, right. Build build more sustainable housing, you know, to, to, to transform the way that we build cities and, and live. I mean, if we focus on the on the practical uh, side of uh, side of uh, side of things, I mean, there is an argument that uh, you know the earth will be fine. I mean, the life will uh, will 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 come back even if we destroy. But it's it's us who are fucked essentially. Uh, so do you do you buy this point? I mean, do you see uh, us being able to adapt to this rapid change to the environment that we are doing? Because there's an argument there that you can you can always hear, okay, the bees will disappear and we will mm. go down with them. Mm. Um, as a biologist, as a, as a mathematician, I mean, how do you see this uh, unfold? Is that is that true? Right, well, we're going outside my field of sure. research yeah. now. However, let's just speculate for a moment. I think what you're talking about is existential risk yes. to the survival of humanity. Humanity exactly. as a whole. Exactly. That's quite a high bar. You know, yeah. it's very easy to think, well, you know, we could have some some nuclear disaster at a global scale, or we could have some absolutely massive um, meltdown of our um, agriculture system so that there's almost no food. And if that were to occur, then huge numbers of people would die and it would be very tragic. Um, but would our species go extinct? Or would some people survive? Would they be um, uh, just in some corner of the globe uh, living sustainably anyway mm. and just, just live on? Uh, or would people just be, I know, under the sea in submarines and then once it's all past, they surface and they manage to survive because there's no one else around? You know, I mean, that, so it's quite a high bar to say all human beings will be dead and our mm. species will be extinct. I think that would take a, a lot right now. Yeah, yeah. But uh, at the same time, I, I already mentioned bees. I don't know whether this is a keystone species, but we do know that there are some species that are critical for the ecosystems that uh, they inhabit. What are what are some of those that you can think of that um, if they go away, we might see some serious trouble? Well, I think your example of pollinators is a very good one mm -hmm. um, because we need pollinators to pollinate many of our food crops. So this definitely speaks directly to the we need it side of biodiversity conservation. Um, and, and yes, there are definitely threats to those species, including uh, habitat loss and including pesticides. Um, so, so yeah, pollinators is a good example. Yeah, yeah. Well... I can I can see we figuring out a, a, a way out of this. We're going to use like tiny drones or something terrible like that. <laughs> but, well, well, I mean, maybe maybe we would, right? Yeah. In which case, you know, he wouldn't starve, but we would have lost something pretty awesome. And I, I right. love bees. I love to see them buzzing around in the flowers. And I think it'd be pretty sad to see tiny... Well, you wouldn't even see those drones, right? Yeah. But um, I think it'd be very sad to lose that. And I also think that, you know, to say we're going to pollinate insect pollinated plants with drones that's really really far out that's yeah. not the t even if we don't care about nature and we just want to survive and for people to be comfortable that's not going to be the technology to save us right, right? right. we're going to save the pollinators that's that's a lot easier than making those drones yeah uh, okay, let's uh, let's take a step back and and speak about you know the number of species that we are actually uh, that we still don't know about. I mean, at what pace do we find, identify, and uh, like sort of add into the database, like on a yearly basis, so to say? Yeah, um, I don't know the numbers mm -hmm. honestly. Um, I think um, there's still well, one of the issues is there still isn't a single database, right? Sure. So it's not clear where it will be added to. There are some fairly recently <laughs> described species that I'm going to mention in my uh, uh, Ratio presentation, okay. actually. So I don't know whether I should 
probably keep them a secret for now. So for, yeah, let's give them a secret. All right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there will be some fairly recently described species mm -hmm. uh, there. Um, often these species are known about, but they're not described because there is this step um, from we know this thing exists, but a scientist hasn't bothered to write the scientific sure. paper to yeah. say that it exists. Yeah. Um, but then there's all the, there's all of the things that we don't even know that they don't exist because we've never even seen them. So it's not a, a case of a scientist bothering to finish the paper from their, yeah. their top drawer. Um, it's it's really just about we haven't done that exploration. I mean, mm. there are still parts of the deep rainforest people don't go there and it's very likely full of all kinds of tiny insects that are novel species yeah. and we, we just don't know that yeah so it's the known unknowns and the unknowns unknowns yeah. and it's uh, it's uh, it's a mess it's uh it is it is very important though to do this work, doesn't it? I mean, because we were like in the context of COVID, for example. Uh, it is obvious that we need hundreds of people on the ground to identify like different viruses and uh, and all that for our own sake. And uh, from on the other side of the coin, we obviously see that many of the species that we find, plant or animal species, they can again from the practical point of view. Uh, contain or create or have things that could be extremely useful for us, like medicine and all of that. That's very true, yeah. actually. And and there is this concept um, that I'm quite a fan of called future options for humanity. And the idea is that even among the known species, we know very little about many of them, right? I mean, if you just pick one of those 2.2 million species, you can see them on one Zoom, right? But when you click on them, you'll see there's no easily accessible information about them. It's just that somewhere in a museum, there's a type specimen, which means that the official record of, of what that species is, and, and that's it. You yeah. Know? So, so we've got no idea what the genetics of that species is, or if it's got some amazing adaptations that we could learn from. And so there's a whole host of things out there in the known species that might be useful to humanity in future in ways that we currently can't even conceive of. And so the idea of retaining it, not just for aesthetic reasons, but for the insurance argument that it's like information that we're deleting or we're letting be deleted, mm. and we don't know yet how that information could be useful. That's a bit of a silly thing to do, isn't it? Yes, yes, it definitely is. I mean, it seems like we do need some sort of a Manhattan Project kind of uh, kind of thing uh, to uh, you know to try to find these things out. I mean, especially when it comes to the micro world. I mean, oh, we, yeah. every every day I read things. It's like okay, we discovered a new bacteria that can eat plastics. Just for example, it's like a bunch of those now. Uh, yeah, so we have no idea what this micro world uh, is actually hiding. So what do we actually need here? Uh, do we have a technological solution uh, to this to this uh, to this problem? Can we automate, you know, genome sequencing, for example? I mean, this is now that we uh, that we come to 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 your field. It's about mathematics mm -hmm. and statistics and numbers and how do you mm -hmm. combine those and and how do you come with an insight from this information? Yeah. Yes. So uh, there are. Uh Clearly, the genome sequencing is one of the big methods that has absolutely exploded in recent years. Yeah. And one of the, the really interesting technologies there is the idea of environmental DNA. So you just go into a, 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 a deep into a forest or you go to a river or something, you take a little sample of river water out, and then you go away and you sequence that DNA. And actually, you can find out which animals... Uh, were around that river because they've left bits of their DNA for various reasons in the river, right? Bits of yeah. skin have come off them or they've urinated in the river and that's that's just all there in some small proportion and you've collected it and so you've got an idea what's there. And so there are new technologies like environmental DNA. Another one is remote sensing, so using satellite imagery, using drones to just automatically collect large amounts of imagery. Wow. And we're talking about not just imagery in the lights that we can see with the human eye, but with many, many different spectra, hyperspectral sensing, they call Ooh, it. And yes. by looking at all these different spectra, you can start to identify much more about what habitats you've got, what plants you've got there. Um, but these things are fairly blunt in the sense that it's going to be hard to discover new species with them. I think they're going to be more about... Um, understanding about the the broad brush patterns of diversity in less accessible areas and much more quickly. Right. And then uh, we have essentially a big data problem on our hands, right? I mean, if you collect uh, like like massive amounts of data, how do you make sense of that? 
You use AI or something like that, you know, to... Yeah, you use data processing methods, you use AI, you use statistics, uh, you use models. Mm. Uh, I, I personally am quite a fan of mechanistic models um, what to understand mean? data. So what I mean is, um, well, let me explain in a sense what statistics is. Sure. Um, so in an analogy, you might... Uh, you might drop a, a ball off a building and you might collect some, some data on how that ball falls to the ground. And you might fit some statistical models to that and you'll find out, oh yeah, you know, the, the, the ball accelerates and you'll be able to sort of determine some things from that. But you would not have understood about gravity or about wind resistance or about the things that really cause it to take that trajectory. You'll be able to predict another ball, what it might do. But if you take a ball and you drop it on the moon instead, you'll be at sea because you've never collected any data on that. Right. Whereas if you use a mechanistic model of a ball falling to the ground, then you can say, well, we know the gravity of the earth, we know about the, the atmosphere, the wind, we know about the shape of the ball, and therefore we're going to predict, and you can fit the data with that mechanistic model, but then you can take that mechanistic model that you verified, and you can predict correctly how a ball would behave on the moon, because it's underpinned by the real processes that you've uncovered and learned about. Yeah. It's very hard to do that with statistics and with AI. And we need that in biology and in ecology and to understand biodiversity because we're exposing biodiversity to new conditions that we've not seen before. And in order to predict how it will behave, we need to understand the mechanisms of how it behaves, not to just sort of extrapolate some line on on a graph if I, if I may sort of be as blunt as to put it like that it seems like yeah some people say that there's the, the you know the hard sciences and the soft sciences and i think people usually mess this up because i mean hard science they uh, you know these are the physics uh, you know and chemistry and all of that it seems to me like sociology and biology are the hard sciences in a sense now it's a mess to predict what it, what what's what's going to happen uh, and yeah, I mean, it seems like we do have to to rely on an outside brain. I mean, we can't do this ourselves, mm. can mm. we? I mean, uh, well, it's it's definitely difficult. Yeah. Um, but f f for me, I wouldn't talk so much about hard and soft sciences. I yeah. would talk about quantitative uh, science, sure. yeah. which means really using numbers to make your predictions and to understand what's going on. Yeah. Hmm. Are there any interesting projects uh, going on like that? I mean, you are which work, you know, obviously uh, working on one, uh, one little branch of this whole crazy effort. Uh, but what other, what other projects are out there to, uh, to try to achieve? What is it that we are aiming for? Like to, to categorize, uh, to categorize all, 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 all life. You already mentioned this project in the US. Uh, but what do we do with this data then? I mean... Well, I mean, the Open Tree of Life project is the the, the big one yeah. um, that I'm aware of, and that's a collaboration between many people. And um, but that itself is collecting data from all around the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, what happens is individual scientists might be working on a, a tree of I don't know ants. Um, or even a small group of ants. And then they they do that as their research, they publish it, and then they upload their tree to the Open Tree of Life, hopefully. And then that gets amalgamated with many other trees of ants and of other things, and it gets automatically processed into the the complete tree that we then take and display on one Zoom. So it's actually like a sort of a, an asynchronous network of different people all around working together mm -hmm. um, and, and contributing to this thing. Um, and uh, the nice thing about the open tree of life is it's open, right? It's not proprietary. All of their data is there. So anyone can use it for anything. Yes. I mean, it, it always seems to be that there are not enough people to do this important work. I mean, we spoke with Dave uh, before that, you know, the amount of information that the amount of uh, like uh, hard things that they can work on, like fossils and all of that far exceeds the number of people that can actually work on them. Yeah. And I would assume with biology is the same situation. I mean, how many people are out there like you, like mathematicians and statisticians and biologists at the same time to do this work? Well, I can't answer, yeah. I can't answer that, Probably honestly. Probably not that I mean, many. There's yeah. definitely enough questions to keep a lot more people busy. Yeah. But to keep more people busy, you need to have funding, which yeah. there's already not enough of. Yeah. And, and also, it, it is worth thinking carefully about what projects to do you know even as an individual um probably individual scientists have hundreds of ideas that just cross their mind and they think that might be fun to work on but you've got to be really selective because yeah. life is short your career is even shorter and you need to choose 
what am I going to contribute to right now? And some of these things just are too high effort and too mm-hmm. low reward to be done. Not sexy uh, enough. <laughs> topics, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, but w- I mean, it, it's like anything. I mean, if we were talking to an artist, probably they've got hundreds of bits of art that they'd like to create that mm-hmm. will never be created unless that artist decides to create them. Um, but they have to decide, you know, what they think will be the the, the, the most appealing or the, 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 the nicest piece of art or the piece of art with a nice message they'll they'll make their decision and they'll create that Mm -hmm. and at least they did something you know so i think science is the same really we have to be selective and we do as much as we can um but there's definitely room for a lot more support of science and scientific research and we will really need it if we're going to solve um the uh, the biodiversity crisis that we have we do need to understand it before we can solve it you know in, in an analogy if our car broke down, right, and we wanted to fix it, we wouldn't just go into that car and move around some random sure. parts hoping that it would work. You know, you need a mechanic who understands how it works. Or if you don't have one available, you need to start thinking, hang on a minute, you know, what do all these parts even do? You know, which right. part isn't working? Could I maybe try to make it work? You've got to really think about how it works. And that's what the scientists are doing at the coal face of research, trying to understand how life on Earth works at all. And that's necessary if we're going to solve the problems with it. Yeah. Yeah. So, but in terms of policies, what do you think are the, like, the most important present things that, that should happen you know, on the basis of the knowledge that we currently have? of how ecosystems and life work. For for solving a biodiversity crisis? Yes, yes. Well, I, I think we need to address the major threats to biodiversity, which are um, habitat loss, um, including habitat fragmentation, which is sort of separating out the, the habitat into different parts that are disconnected. Uh, we need to solve climate change. Oh, God, and, yes, this uh, big elephant. That's quite uh, enough to be getting along with. Yeah. Right? I mean, there are other things. There's there's pollution that isn't related to climate change, and there's invasive species, um, yeah. and there's over-exploitation of natural resources. Um, I mean, all of, all of these things are problems. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, you know, I, I hate to say this, but unfortunately, I think to, to get an acceptable outcome will require a lot more um, effort and, and focus from policymakers than we're currently seeing um, yeah. generally. Yeah. There is an interesting argument out there that in order to solve all these crises, we essentially have to deal with uh, one single thing, and this is poverty. Uh, because, I mean, we see that in rich societies, people tend to care about the environment, you know, because they don't have other things to worry about, you know, essentially. So, and speaking about these uh, areas that are currently endangered, we all, like, we speak about, you know, the, uh, the Amazon, the Congo, you know, these are all areas populated by people who, by necessity, have to destroy their own environments uh, in order to to sustain themselves, right? Yes, you're absolutely right. And this yeah. is a, a connection that's often um, lost on people. Yeah. Right? They, they don't realize it, right? Because at the end of the day, human beings, they want to, we're animals too, right? Yeah. We've evolved as long as all of these other creatures and we want to survive. Sure. Um, and therefore, if we can't get food or our family's life's under threat or anything like that, you know, we'll probably do anything we can, you know, it, uh, in order to, to solve that problem. Yeah. That just becomes your priority. That's just in our nature. And therefore, yeah, you're absolutely right that we will need to solve um, poverty in the area, in, in well, everywhere really, yes. um, because people in the poverty um, will be forced to exploit um, uh, biodiversity in order to survive, yes. and they might not be doing that in the in the right way. So we shouldn't be saying those people are wrong. We shouldn't allow them to do that. We should instead be helping them to not need to do that. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. We, uh, you know, ask him, ask ask them on the gunpoint. It's like don't hunt for the orangutan. Yeah, but I have a like a kid to feed. Feed. You know, it's not that simple. Yes, but actually, um, no, no, you're. you're you're right about that but another part of it is about education sure right um so for instance there's a lot of instant cases where you get a human wildlife conflict where people are just sort of scared of snakes because they think well it might bite us and so they just kill it because oh yeah it's yeah. a snake yeah um uh, or, or or they don't realize that this animal that they've got you know loads of different animals that they could hunt and they don't realize that one of them is critically endangered and, and the whole world only lives where they live yeah they don't realize how special it is and if you explain that then that they would hunt 
something else. You know, they would hunt something else, and that 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 species would, uh, or maybe they would even set up some ecotourism around right. around that species. Yes. You know, so there would be some solution. But if people aren't aware, so I think education is is a thing as well as、uh, lifting people out of poverty. Yes, yes, it's not about、uh, helping necessarily the animals themselves. It's more helping people, as you as you said, to realize to change their lives to to take them out of poverty and. You know the change will come in itself. You know. Y- yes. Well, I mean, it's about helping the animals as well, right? Because、yeah, a really、certainly. effective thing we can do、um, uh, is to have more natural areas. Yes. To have more more space for nature, either by preserving s- spaces that we would otherwise be destroying to just. Hold that destruction and try to do something else instead, or to restore an area that's been destroyed in the past that's、right. now not so relevant anymore. So, so, so that's an obvious way that we can help biodiversity. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully, we will see some you know specific policy changes. I mean, we are already seeing that、uh, in places, but yeah, I mean, we should be worried as you as you said. Yeah, I mean, you're right that, that it's definitely. I mean, if you if you compare what policymakers say now to what they were saying 20 years ago, climate. Change and, and, and biodiversity—they're they're much more talked about than they used to be. But unfortunately, what I worry about is that it's like a box-ticking exercise. Yeah, we've said something about biodiversity.、Uh, we've done this little thing to help biodiversity, and so、um, th- that's it. That's done. And now let's move on to the other issues people are worried about. And、uh, it, it's really such a tiny contribution to what's needed.、Yeah. You know, it's, it's really pulling the wool over people's eyes of the the scale of change that's going to be、mm. needed in order to. Resolve this. Oh my God! I mean, me as a as a person with children, you know, everything worries me. Yeah. You know? Sorry, I didn't. I didn't intend. <laughs> I didn't intend to cause yeah, worry. Yeah, but, yeah. But but, I, but I think. In that way. But I think it's a it's it's a useful type of stress. I think we should all be all be concerned.、Uh, well, we are at the end of our conversation,、uh, James. Unfortunately, it's it is a short one because we have plenty of more interviews to do.、Uh, but thank you for、uh, for staying with us, and、uh, we're very happy that you will be our guest on the Ratio. Forum, and I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. It's been a, a great pleasure to be here. Terrific. Okay. Скъпи приятели, благодаря ви че останахте с нас. Ако ви харесва това което правим, може да ни подкрепите на сайта patreon.com на клона черта рацио бг да си купите някоя книжка от нас или пак просто да разкажете на някой приятел за този подкаст. Благодаря ви че ни слушахте и до следващия път. Чао.